Welcome to Grace Church of Orange. We are a Christ-centered community intent on proclaiming the gospel, making disciples, and sacrificially serving Jesus. Thank you so much for joining this live stream worship service. We are going to worship the Lord with all our hearts, pray dependently, and hear the inspired, inerrant, infallible word of God. excited to be here together because Christ has united us to himself and given us fellowship with one another and hope and joy and peace and so we're excited to worship this morning together welcome if you are new or visiting or even visiting on the live stream we here at grace are a christ-centered community intent on proclaiming the gospel making disciples and sacrificially serving jesus we are about christ and so we pray that that's who you would see us to be and that we would um we pray that god would make us more and more into those people well, you'll see on your seat uh, or around, the wind may have blown them around, but you'll see uh, some cards that let you know what's coming up here. We have quite a few things coming up. We have summer events that are on there, and also you can use the QR code to see what's coming up. But in particular, we have some men's and women's events coming up, a men's game night on the 30th and some other things. So check those out, join us, sign up, let us know you'll be coming. And then also, something new for us, uh, we have something called the Church Center app. So if you want to uh, use your phone to sign up for things, see what's coming up, stay connected, that can be a very helpful thing. It's called the Church Center app. So you can look that up. Well, we're gonna read from Psalm 108 as we continue worshiping the Lord this morning. If you're able, please stand with me. I'm gonna read verses three and four from Psalm 108 as we begin this morning. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations, for your steadfast love is great above the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. 
And Father, we do want to worship and praise you for your steadfast love, your faithfulness, your grace, your power that commands the winds, that controls every molecule in this universe. And so we worship you as the sovereign king of all things who is both strong and wise and good and overflowingly kind. And so we worship you this morning in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.
We're going to sing a new song together now called All of Our Tomorrows. As you catch the melody, please uh, join us in singing. Season. 
grab your Bibles and turn to Ecclesiastes. We're going to be in chapter 12 this morning, and I will be reading from verses 1 through 8. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, we'll start in verse 1. Remember also your Creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near, of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return after the rain. In the day when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men are bent and the grinders cease because they are few. And those who look out, who look through the windows are dimmed and the doors on the street are shut. When the sound of the grinding is low and one rises up at the sound of a bird and all the daughters of song are brought low. They are afraid also of what is high and terrors are in the way. The almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper drags itself along and desire fails because man is going to his eternal home and the mourners go about the streets. Before the silver cord is snapped or the golden bowl is broken or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain or the wheel broken at the cistern and the dust returns to the earth as it was and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. You may be seated. We're going to pray together this morning. And as we do pray, we want to remember Eric and Debbie Smith. Eric and Debbie are two of our missionaries who serve uh, to support a team of church planners, primarily throughout Asia. And so we want to remember them this morning and our brothers and sisters around the world. So if you would, let's pray together. Father, we do trust you with both today and as we just sung with all of our tomorrows. We don't know what the future holds, but you do. You know every detail and you are in control over it. And you are strong and you are good and you are kind. And so we worship and we trust you. Father, we worship you also for your, your grace and your mercy. You say that you're rich in mercy and that you're, you have tender mercy towards your children. And we know that you rescued us when we were running from you. You rescued us not because there was anything special or better than us about other people, but only because of your kindness and your goodness. And so we praise you for that. We thank you that you not only rescue us, but you are transforming us now and you will keep us close until the end. Lord, we pray for those who are in pain. We just read about how all of our bodies will deteriorate. And we know, Lord, that you have rescued our souls and that you will one day give us new bodies. But we pray, Lord, for those who are struggling in pain with their body right now, who are struggling with disease or with sickness. Lord, that we ask that, we ask that you would take away the pain. But even if you don't, we ask more than that, that you would make us like your son through the things that you bring into our life. Bring whatever is necessary to conform us to the image of Jesus, to give us joy and peace and trust in you. Father, we pray for Eric and Debbie Smith. We ask that their ministry to the church planters in Asia would be one that is strong and that is an encouragement to them. Lord, let the gospel go out clearly and boldly through their ministry. Open doors to places where, where Christ is not yet known. Uh, and Father, we pray for our brothers and sisters around the world. We, we're united to them because we are all united with Christ. And so we hurt when they hurt. When they are imprisoned, it pains us. When they are persecuted, it hurts us. And so we ask that you would uphold them and strengthen them and give them joy even in the midst of pain. Father, this morning, we ask that you would transform us by the preaching of your word, form Christ in us, transform us into the image of your son, and then send us out with lives that show the beauty and the truth of the gospel and that honor Jesus. It's in his name and for his glory that we pray. Amen. everlasting hope your grace on which I stand it's where my life begins my future held within your grace on which I stand and oh this grace on which 
Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are our salvation, and we thank you that you are the one who is worthy. You are the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Lord, we thank you that by your blood you have taken away our sins and you have brought us near to God. We praise you for that. We thank you for this chance to worship this morning. We pray that you would help our hearts to be open now to what your word is telling us, that your spirit would press your word upon our hearts. We pray it all for the glory of Jesus Christ. Amen. For those in the tent, welcome to the wind tunnel. First hour was way worse. For those on the live stream, welcome to the not wind tunnel. We're in the Word of God today. We're in Ecclesiastes 12. The Word of God is perfect, and it is sweeter than honey. It is food for our souls. And we are going to see today a real feast on some of the final words in Ecclesiastes. That's where we're at today. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, and it's going to really show the, the faithful reality of the eventual decline of our, of our minds and bodies, the deterioration, and then this short life is over. And uh, we are very time-conscious people, aren't we? It's like this hourglass here 
Well, let's go ahead and start it. We put clocks on everything. You know, Samuel Rutherford said, the, t- the sands of time are sinking. You can't make that sand go faster or slower. It's just going to go. But it is interesting, we put clocks on everything. Our refrigerators, our ovens, our, our, uh, our phones, our computers, our coffee makers. And we are very time bound. And I think it's very fair to say we are actually time enslaved. All too often, time enslaved. We, we schedule things down to the minute, don't we? We have our schedule. We time everything. We time our appointments, our meetings, our sporting events, our worship services. And we live driven by deadlines. You need to get somewhere today. Most of you need to get somewhere after this. And so, you know, we want to beat the proverbial buzzer. We want to beat the closing bell. We want to, you know, we hear this all the time. Act now while there is time. Special offer, you know, only this percentage off or whatever. While the offer lasts, the clock is ticking. The sands of time are are sinking. Life is short and we are time bound and life is very short. Scientists once thought that the vertebrate with the shortest lifespan was uh, the turquoise killifish which was a small fish living in seasonal rain pools in equatorial Africa, 12-week life cycle. That's a really short life. Most people live far longer than that. Now, researchers in Australia have actually found that the pygmy goby has the shortest lifespan. It's tiny fish living in coral reefs, average of 56 days of life. Most people live much longer than that, but still, Life is short. It is, as, as Solomon puts it, it's brief. It's a vapor. It's a collection of years and choices and outcomes. And it's all in God's hands. All in God's hands. These verses we're looking at today, Ecclesiastes 12, 1 through 8. We, we looked at verse 1 in depth several weeks ago. We're going to go in, back into verse 1 and then all the way to verse 8 today. And it is a call to remember God before it is too late, before all the sand drops out, before your time is up, before all the days that were ordained for you, when before there was even one, before all those days are done in your life. There is a call to order your life around who God is and what he does And what he has said in his word, it is a call to have him at the forefront of your heart and your mind in order to please him. That's what we're going to see today. Solomon writes wise, sage advice to the relatively younger and exhorts us to serve God while there is time, while you have motivation, while you have strength to do so. We start in verse 1. It begins with the word remember. Don't forget, remember your creator. Remember, acknowledge, recall, remind, keep in remembrance, make a memorial, recognize. This is more than forget, not forgetting. It's more than just saying, okay, I can't forget. This is, you need to act on what you know and you need to do it now. This is the idea of making something or someone central to your life. Remember your creator. That word in the Hebrew is in plural, and it emphasizes the majesty and the preeminence and the power of God, the superiority of God. This should boomerang you right back into Genesis. Creator is is, a, is an idea of beginnings. God created the world. He, he existed before he created. And it, it shoots you right back into Genesis, the book of beginnings. If you don't get Genesis right, you're going to get the whole Bible wrong. Genesis is this book of beginnings, and it tells us that everything had its origin in the sovereign creator, the triune God, who is the sustainer of everything. And it tells us also how we got into this mess that we are in due to our sin. That we were made by God, our creator. That we are unmade by sin and we can only be remade in Christ. 
and what he has done at the cross, believing by faith, by the grace of God being saved because Jesus took our sin upon himself at the cross. Genesis tells us of a sovereign creator that providentially orchestrates everything and he created a plan to save sinners before the world began. So to remember your creator, you need to remember what he has done. Job even said, remember to extol his work. Highlight it, of which men have sung. Man beholds it from afar. God is great, but his years are unsearchable. God's on a different timetable than us. He's unhindered by time. He's on his own perfect time schedule. You know when something happens in your life and you're like, that was perfect timing. It says God sovereignly orchestrates all things. The psalmist says, this I remember. This is what I'm remembering. I'm pouring my soul out to God. He even says that my soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember these things. Remember the greatness of the creator. And he even says this in Psalm 42. The psalmist says, I remember you, God, from the land of Jordan and Hermon, Mount Hermon, the highest point in Israel. And then he says something very interesting. He says, and I remember you from Mount Mizar. That's the only time in the Bible it's even mentioned. It, some people think it's poetic for Mount Zion. But what he's getting at here is that I remember you, Lord, from the land of Jordan, from the land that you have blessed, and from the highest point, even to the seemingly insignificant that you keep your covenant promises. You are remembering a God, you're acknowledging a God who keeps his covenant promises and continues to show his love even to the most seemingly insignificant. You might feel that way today. The psalmist says in Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits. Remember them all. Bless his holy name. And this is very specific. It gets very specific. It is not generic. Oh, I'm blessing God. And you're just thinking generic about God. No, you need to think about who God is and what he has done. Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead. Jesus, the creator of the world, as John 1 tells us. Jesus Christ, remember him, risen from the dead, offspring of David, very crucial, very significant, according to the covenant promises of God. And then you get to 1 Corinthians 11, and we celebrated the Lord's table last week as a church. And we are instructed to remember Christ's substitutionary death in our place at the cross. Jesus himself said, do this in remembrance of me. Remember me. You know, believe in Christ. Receive his word. Worship him now. Seek to please him. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. That's relative youth. That's, in those days, that would be young manhood. It's a time of strength, a time of vision, a time of determination, a time of decision a time of action, a time of motivation, a time of optimism, a time of energy, when you're relatively young. When you're relatively young, marvel at the sovereign creator who made all things, the, the maker of heaven and earth and you. Marvel at his goodness. Order your life under him. Orient your life around his word. This is the call of, of the preacher in Ecclesiastes 12.1. And there is this, this desperate element to the call. There is this, this desperate urgency to it. it. It's like this. Don't wait. Start doing it now. Remember God in your relative youth. This is like... If you called 911, said, come now, we need help. You got to get here now. There's this desperate urgency of not waiting here. Start doing this now, right this moment, this very day. And, and the reason 
it is so urgent is because as you go through the rest of this passage, from verses 1 to verse 8, you see three befores. You see the word before three times, and it really forms our outline for today. And the idea is you remember God, remember your creator in your relative youth before certain things happen. And this is a very poetic passage, and it really pictures the mind and the body winding down and wearing out. There's images of aging. They're not easy for us to take because, especially if you're in the middle of it, it's painful to think about. But it pictures, the first picture we get is one of a dilapidated house, and then some, some, some illustrations from nature, and then it ends in a funeral procession. And we all know what that means. So let's look at these three befores. It starts in verse 1. Second part of verse 1 says this. Before, and that literally means as far up to, until, up to that day, as, as far, and when that happens, before the difficult days come, the evil days come, of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. He's saying, get your soul ready for difficult days. Get your soul. Now, some of you, you're like, this is the furthest thing from your mind. You're so young and you have so much energy, you're like, I am not thinking about this at all. It's up until the days of no delight, before the difficult days of no delight, the evil days, the days of misery, of distress, of agony, of injury, the days of no pleasure. Get your soul ready for difficult days. doesn't mean that when those days come that you will have no joy. It's just the scales will tip to the side of tougher days. And this is not a defeatist attitude. This is a realistic picture of how life goes. There's peaks and pits. It's like, I, I, the picture I get is like when you're at an amusement park and you're on the log ride or, or a roller coaster and you're, you're about to go over the falls, right? You're about to go over the big drop. Where, where then your stomach drops and you have that weird feeling in your stomach. I get it every time. He is about to say something that's going to make it feel like the bottom is dropping out of life. He's going to talk about getting old and feeling the effects. For some of you, it's a long way off. Others are just getting into it. Some of you, when you met me, I didn't have gray hair or glasses. Some have endured it for quite some time. You're relatively older than others of us. And what Solomon is saying is remember God, you'll look to Christ because you've got to take now the entire aggregate teaching of Scripture in mind if you're sitting here in 2021 with us. Look to Christ. Trust him. Seek first God's kingdom. Believe in Jesus. Receive his word. Worship him and do it now. None of you know when you're going to expire. It's like a thief on the cross. When he says to Jesus, he's about to die. He says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember me. He acknowledged belief in his creator. Jesus Christ who was dying for his sins right that very moment. We're seeing here that this is the normal part of the life cycle. Things fall apart. Things fall apart. If you have an artificial hip or some kind of, of transplant, you know what I'm talking about. The whole creation is in bondage to decay. We were made by God. We were unmade by sin. We can only be remade in Christ. And you remember, I want you to remember something here because this can really be a downer. You're like, man, this is kind of depressing. I, I don't want to think about this right now. I'm in pain as it is, and now I have to I'll think about this. I want you to, to look at the context of the passage we are in and realize that it says remember God, but right before that, the two verses right before that, if you look up into chapter 11, verse 9, we're called to rejoice in the life that God gives us. We're called to have joy in God. And we're just, I want you to remember that your life is to be heavily wrapped in joy. 
Chapter 11, verse 9 tells you that. Rejoice. You need to be permeated with the joy that God gives. But you'll notice in verse 10, then it says, remove vexation far from you. That's the opposite of joy. And then remember God. Keep him front of heart and mind always. You know, you never resemble the Trinitarian God more than when you're filled with joy. Grumpiness is a sin. Some of you are like, you know, I deserve to be grumpy. I'm going to be grumpy. I will make everyone around me miserable because I'm so miserable. Grumpiness is a sin. We men are most susceptible to that, to look at the world with negative lenses. But this is a call to God magnifying joy in light of difficult days of no delight. In Psalm 16, in verse 11, we read that in God's presence there is, there is fullness of joy, complete joy, utter joy, and that in his presence there are pleasures unending. I think the more that you try to make this world into a heaven, the less you're going to enjoy it. And the less you try to make this world into a heaven, the more you're going to be able to enjoy it because you won't be weighing life down with demands that it can't fulfill. There's true joy in Christ and in everything he has blessed you with. But have God at forefront of your heart and mind before the difficult days of no delight and be joyful. Remember to rejoice in the days that God blesses you with. Now this leads us to up to the second before in verse two. So, so look at verse two with me. It says before. So now it's going to start getting really specific. So he's a bit general on the first before. Before the difficult days of no delight. But now remember God before you deteriorate. And there's these images of aging that we're going to get one after another. First, again, the picture of a dilapidated house, then some illustrations from nature, and then a funeral procession. And all of this indicates and illustrates wearing out and winding down. And some people think it's a long way off for them. They think there's just you know, it's, it's going to happen a long, a long time from now in my life. But most people don't realize how s soon it could be. Some die young. Jim Elliott, who was a missionary to Ecuador, when he was younger, he was discussing with his family the idea of a, a friend who had a loved one die, and the loved one was very young. And he said, God is peopling eternity. We can't limit him to just older folks. But listen to what it says. Look at verse 2. Before you deteriorate, before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened, that's when your eyesight goes, and the clouds return after rain, and youth is typically a time of dawning light and old age of twilight's gloom. Verse 3 says, In the day when the keepers of the house, the protectors of the house, tremble. These are your hands and your arms, which protect the body, just like guards protecting a, a palace. And sometimes you shake in old age, and it's not like you wake up one day and say, I want my, my hands to shake, but sometimes that happens. Your eyes go, your hands and arms get weaker, you even start to shake, and then the strong men are bent, the legs, they bow down, they're the supporting pillars of of your, of your body weaken. And then the grinders cease because they're few. Your teeth, you might lose some teeth. I, I cracked a tooth 15 years ago and I, it was a sad day for me. I was like, I wanted that tooth. And they had to pull it out and drill into my jaw and put a screw in there, put an implant in there. It's not a real tooth. You're gonna lose some teeth as you get older. And then those who look through the windows are dimmed. Your eyes start to fail. And then verse 4, the doors on the street are shut. It's a plural there, doors, like two doors shut. It's your lips not having much to say. 
Some of you are like, oh, I'll always have a lot to say. And then the sound of the grinding is low. Your ears, you're not able to hear as well when you get older. And, and one rises up at the sound of a bird. You're like, you don't need an alarm to wake up. You, you're a light sleeper. And all the daughters of song are brought low. The, the voice that once loved to sing music, the capacity to sing gets diminished. Your lungs have a less, lesser capacity when you're getting older. And you'll notice that the body here is being depicted as a dwelling. It's also how Job described the body. He speaks of the body as a house of clay. Paul speaks of it in 2 Corinthians 5.1 as our earthly house, the body we live in that God has given us. And the picture here is that in its heyday, the, the house stood firm, but now that's a distant memory. And some of you might feel that way. Some of you like, feel like I have fallen apart. I, I don't know how I even got here. I like, put duct tape on myself to get to church or walk across the room. Gorilla tape. And then the scene shifts here from the metaphor of a house to some general pictures of old age. In verse 5, it says that they're afraid of what's on high, what is high, afraid of heights. It's a common thing. A fear of falling is common when you get older. Brittle bones and the slightest stumble can bring disaster upon you. Some of you that have fallen and been injured, you know. And then terrors are on the way. Sometimes when you're older, you have a fear of going on a long journey or going in a plane. And this is part of, for some people, part of getting older. The poet once said, I'm dying now. I'm done for. What on earth was all the fun for? For I'm old and ill and terrified. Then it says the almond tree blossoms. Almond tree blossom, that's a white blossoming tree among dark trees. It's your hair turning white or gray. The almond tree had red blossoms, but when it falls, it, it resembles snow on the ground. You can color your hair if you want, but Proverbs 16.31 tells me that gray hair is a crown of glory. And then the grasshopper drags itself along. It, it, it's a burden refers to the unsteadiness of those that get older and, and there's some weakness and even sometimes a light thing feels heavy and you were able to lift it before and now you aren't able to as much. And this is a reality that is very painful for you when you go through that. It says desire fails. It's your appetite. You're not as hungry as before. In fact, in, in Solomon's time, this was referring to the caper berry that was used to stimulate the appetites in Solomon's time. And as you get older, the desire diminishes with age and caperberry doesn't work on you anymore. And the reason is because man is going to his eternal home. That's what it says in verse five. Man is going to his eternal home. The journey drawing to a close. And it says that as, as man is going to his eternal home, then mourners go about in the streets. That's a funeral procession. The eternal home is beckoning and streets are filled with mourning. Man goes to his eternal home while mourners are in the streets. Recently, when Angela's father died in Virginia, we went back to Marion, Virginia, a small town in, in southwest Virginia, and as we were going from the mortuary to the cemetery and we're driving along in the procession, every car in town stopped to show respect. Everyone in that town pretty much knows each other. And the mourners were in the streets because someone had died. The psalmist says at one point, the years of our life are 70 or by reason of strength, 80. Now I know some 90 year olds, you know, so 90 must be the new 70, but I know some 90-year-olds that are pretty strong. The years of our life are 70, by reason of strength, 80, yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone, and we fly away. Joseph Conrad said, I remember my youth and the feeling that will never come back anymore, the feeling that I could last forever, outlast the sea, the earth, and all men. The deceitful feeling that lures us on to joys and perils and love and vain effort and even death. The triumphant conviction of strength, the heat of life, and the handful of dust. 
The glow in the heart that with every year grows dimmer and colder and smaller and expires too soon. I think this is one of the reasons why God wants you to be anchored in joy and be anchored in hope. If you're a believer in Jesus, you are anchored in hope and joy. And when you live that way, you can be described like Paul described the Thessalonians and said, we are not like those who grieve with no hope. We grieve with hope. We go through the sadness of life and loss, but we have hope in the return of Christ. But those who decide to live in a dungeon, you will grieve with despair. If you say, I'm just going to be bitter, I'm just going to be grumpy, I'm just going to live in a dungeon. And this really is a call to gratefulness, not grumpy resignation. It's like the psalmist says in Psalm 63, oh God, you are my God. Your steadfast love is better than life. My soul will be satisfied. My mouth will praise you when I remember you upon my bed. And maybe you can't get out of your bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night, for you have been my help. In the shadow of your wings, I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. My, your right hand upholds me, the strength of God. You might be feeling like you're falling apart today. But if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus, God is the strength of your soul. And you can live in a dungeon or you can live with delight. You can be gloomy or glad. And I want to say this, and I'll say it carefully, but all old age is not pretty. All old age is not beautiful because all old people are not happy. Some are wretched and hollow, and others, though, live a life of joy. And it is seen in the countenance. So many people live with regrets. They're just hammering themselves all the time or hammering others. Some people are displeased with God's providence in their life. That might be you. I don't like the hand I was dealt. There's a song that I love. It's an old folk song. But it just has this one line. It's, it's for believers, okay? If you're not a believer, it's not for you. But if, if you're a believer, this, this is for you. It says, we cannot have all things to please us, no matter how we try, till we've all gone to Jesus, we can only wonder why. And you think about all the unanswered questions in your life and you're trying to figure it out, and you're old and you feel young inside, and you know, I am living in light of dying. Living in light of dying. And in life's grinding reality, what I've found is that God does exceedingly, abundantly more than we could ever ask or think. As you get older, you just take nothing for granted. You, you, you start savoring moments because you have God at forefront of heart and mind, unless you're living in a dungeon. But what we're being told here is that before the difficult days of no delight, before your, your mind and your body deteriorate, just live joyful and grateful with God at front of heart and mind. And then he caps it off in verses six through eight. Look at verse six. The third before, the third before, the sands of time are sinking. And he says this, before the silver cord. So he's going to start giving images of death. He's going to illustrate death. Before the silver cord, it's the only time in the Bible silver cord is mentioned. It's like Fanny Crosby in her song, um, some, I will see him face to face. You know, someday the silver cord will break. I will see him face to face. Speaking of her savior, Jesus. But before the silver cord, only mentioned in the Bible, is snapped. It's a lamp hanging from a silver chain, breaking with age. Some say that's the spinal cord. Or the golden bowl. Some say it's the brain or the skull is broken. Or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain. The lungs fail. Or the wheel broken at the cistern. Your heart fails. 
You'll notice that silver and gold are things of value. This is speaking of the sanctity of life. Your life matters from the youngest to the oldest. Your life matters in God's sight. You get this picture of a silver cord holding a golden bowl and it's removed. The bowl is damaged beyond repair and the winding gear was raised and lowering the pitcher into a well comes crashing down and smashes the pitcher, shatters. And this is picturing sudden departure, sudden death. This evidence of decay and the moment of death takes you by surprise. There's a fable. It was told of a man who made an agreement with death, made a deal with death, and said, I will go willingly when it's time for me to die as long as you send a messenger in advance to warn me. And years pass, and one night, death suddenly appears, and the man is angry. He says, what? No warning? We had an agreement. And death says, I've sent you many messengers. Look in the mirror. You know what it's like if you're relatively older. You feel young inside, but you look older. You're walking up to people, and they're looking, trying to recognize you. One said this, inside every old person is a young person wondering what happened. We know what happens. Verse 7 tells us, the dust returns to the earth as it was. Solomon is recalling Genesis again. Remember your creator and the dust returns. Genesis 2-7, the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. But you also have to go to Genesis 3-19. After the fall, the curse of the fall, God says, by the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground Out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. He's contemplating the end of life. The spirit returns to God who gave it. This is death. This is the reversal of Genesis 2-7. And sin's effects. We see it in 3.19. It's a cruel reversal of God's intentions. That we were made to live forever with God in paradise and we chose to sin, and now we can only be remade in Christ. You were made by God. You're undone by sin. You can only be remade in Christ. The Bible is repeat with examples where the psalmist says, you return man to the dust, O Lord. You know our frame. You remember we are dust. All flesh will perish together, and man will return to the dust. All are from dust, Ecclesiastes 3.20, and to dust all return. One day you will expire. Your time will be up. God's curse on creation in response to the fall means time will see you unmade. Maybe sooner than later, God knows. But the preacher here is taking us by the hand and saying, so, how will you live? How then will you live? Solomon goes heavy on a topic we don't want to talk about. And it might be slow and it might be sudden. Human nature wants to live, but because of sin, we die. And don't we just spend untold resources trying to keep alive? Constant search for the cure of everything from the common cold to cancer. And in this moment in which we live, never before have so many hopes and fears been pinned on one vaccine. But the one who holds every atom and every molecule who upholds all things by the word of his power, has your life in his hands. He is the one who determined how many stars, Psalm 147, he determined how many stars would be in the sky and gave each of them a name. We cannot even count them, and God has everyone in his hands. How much more does he have your life in his hands? Your days are numbered by God. Psalm 139. Verse 16 says, in your book were written all the days that were ordained for me before there was even one of them. So we see this picture of the spirit breathed into him by God returns to its creator. As Job put it, the Lord gave and the Lord takes away. As Timothy 
was told by Paul, we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it either. As we're reminded that our Savior, Christ Jesus, abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. See, for the Christian, there is a glorious hope of resurrection. Through Christ's death and resurrection, the curse is irrevocably reversed for the believer. As Paul put it, this corruptible might must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. And then the question, oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, death, where is your victory? And then the answer, we have the victory in our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says in Romans 8.10, if Christ is in you, if you're a believer in Christ, although the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is life because of righteousness. Paul told the Philippians, our citizenship is in heaven from which we await a savior, the Lord Jesus, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that he has to subject all things to himself. Everything that a Christian values is in heaven. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, your name, your inheritance, your reward, your beloved brethren that have gone before, everything you should love forever and think about is in heaven. And knowing that you will depart, hopefully with a wrinkled face and a brand new heart, is a call to purity of life. What did the psalmist say in Psalm 119, verse 9? How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. But our big problem is we love the wrong things. We love money and we love hatred and we love misery and we love grudges and we love idolatry. And the Bible must be our compass, must be our counselor, must be our constant companion because it cultivates joy and gratefulness and a desire for holiness. As the psalmist put it, your statutes have been my songs in the house of my sojourning. I remember your name in the night. O Lord, I keep your law. I have kept your precepts. From my youth you have taught me. I still proclaim your wondrous deeds. To old age and gray hairs, do not forsake me till I proclaim your might to another generation. I have been young and now I am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken. We must have an ambition to please God. You must want to please God. Let me ask you, right now, today, today, April 18th, 2021, is there some unfinished business in your life? some sin you need to confess, some sin you need to repent of, someone you need to make up with, someone you need to reconcile with, someone you need to plant gospel seeds with, someone you need to build up and bless before it's too late, before the last grain of sand in the hourglass drops. Look, we're all the same. Our feelings get the best of us and we have to go back to the word of God and say it is true and every promise and every assurance is trustworthy. And we need to remind ourselves of these things and remind each other about these things. Why did the Bible say consider to stir one another up to love and good deeds? As you see the day approaching, as you gather together, keep telling yourself and keep telling others the truth. Surrender to Christ. You were made by God. You were unmade by sin. You can only be remade by Christ. And so if you're young today, if you're relatively young, you can figure out your own category here, okay? I got eyes though. If you're, if you're young, you got strength and motivation. You have, you, in your mind, you're thinking, I have so much time ahead of me. If you're not a believer, you need to believe in the Lord Jesus right now. You believe in his death and his resurrection and his return. And, and if you're older, and again, put yourself in whatever category you want to be put in today. If you're older, it is not too late. Your life is significant. You might be strapped together with duct tape, but I'm going to tell you, your life matters. And I will tell you this too. If you are not a Christian right now, but God is opening your heart, 
It's because a greater crushing of your pride must take place because more people get saved when they're young, less people get saved when they're old. Greatest mission field right now in this country are retirement homes all over this country with a lot of hardened hearts. So a greater crushing of your pride must take place if you are to be saved. But either way, if God has opened your heart to the gospel and you are older, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. There is no other way to get saved. Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. It is appointed unto man once to die, then comes the judgment. And you cannot just say, I'm going to try harder. You must have Christ. You must have Christ. And then you can make these last years count, however many God gives you. Remember your creator, his words, his ways, before it's too late. Jesus' second coming is going to be sudden. No one knows the day or the hour except the Father. Therefore, be ready. The Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. Verse 8. Boomerangs us right back to the opening line of Ecclesiastes. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And that doesn't mean that it's worthless. It means it's brief. It's, it's a mist. It's a vapor. It's a mere breath. It's fleeting. It's elusive. Someone said this once. I think that God planned the strength and beauty of youth to be physical, but the strength and beauty of age to be spiritual because we gradually lose the strength and beauty that is temporary so that we will concentrate on the strength and the beauty which is forever. So we will be eager to leave the temporary, the deteriorating part of us, and be truly homesick for our eternal home. Because if we stayed young and strong and beautiful, we might never want to leave. Lord, we thank you and praise you that by your strength and for your glory, we can number our days that we might present to you a heart of wisdom so that at the end of our days, we might hear, well done, good and faithful servant. We know life is short. We know that we cannot make that sand fall through the hourglass faster or slower, but we want to remember you before the difficult days of no delight, before we deteriorate, before we die. Only because of what Jesus Christ has done for us in our place at the cross, promised and promise kept, and now a promise return. We know, Lord, that you are forming Christ in each believer. Faithful are you who calls us, who will bring it to pass. May we redeem the time and make the best use of every moment you grant us. May you be at the forefront of our hearts and minds that we would please you that we would be able to stand at the judgment with great joy rather than great shame. And we praise you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you stand with us as we sing one last song together?
encourage you to uh, fellowship together. Uh, we also have uh, Bible classes all the hours, so we have something third hour. Also, uh, this Wednesday is part two of how to study the Bible. If you weren't able to make it last Wednesday, you can still join us. Also, make sure you take these cards. We've got our summer calendar going. Make sure that you mark your calendars with uh, all the great things that we are able to do together. And let's close now with Jude 24 and 25. Now to him who is able, strong, to keep you from stumbling and present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Thank you for joining us for this worship service today. We're so glad you took the time to be with us as we sang our hearts out, as we prayed dependently, and as we heard the inspired, inerrant, infallible Word of God. If you can join us in person, we'd love to have you. We meet at 8, 9.30, and 11 a.m. every Sunday. For more information, you can go to graceorange.org. Thanks so much, and God bless you.